Afternoon, everybody. This is Richard Peter with Praxis Spinal Cord Institute, um, and we're actually going to here do our second edition of the Fireside Chat. Um, and today we're going to sort of talk about um, in the lead up to the Paralympic Games that are coming up in China, and we've got a very uh, special guest here today. I've got Josh Duick, who is a multi-Paralympic uh, athlete and very got quite the accolades behind him, and then also is the chef de mission that is going to be leading the team in the 2020 or 2022 Beijing Games, um, Winter Paralympic Games. So um, first, yeah, I'd like to say this is gonna be recorded and so hopefully we can share it on um, different avenues on social media. And so if you have any comments or questions, yeah, send them on afterwards and we'll get to them. Um, but so enough about me, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's really get to it. And, and just, I'd like Josh to say uh, a quick introduction. Sure, Richard, thanks for having me. Uh, what can I say? Uh, we're just a few days out from our uh, final departure, packing our bags as we speak, uh, getting the team ready to go over to Beijing. So certainly a lot of excitement in the air. It's palatable. And uh, what else can I say? Um, I've been in a wheelchair for nearly 18 years. So it's 2004. And uh, I'll never, ever, ever forget uh, a poster of this very good looking, talented and strong First Nations wheelchair basketball player by the name of Richard Peter. And I was just like, wow, cool. Like, okay, there's sport and there's life outside of these hallways at GF Strong. And I was like, wow, okay, okay. So this kind of like lit a spark early on. So to be right here with you right now is pretty special moment for me. Uh, so within those 18 years, as you mentioned, Richard, I've gone on and um, followed my own dreams in the sporting world and competed for Canada in Vancouver and in Sochi in the sport of Sitski. Uh, I've started a family. So my wife and I, we've got two little kids that are a growing concern. Nova's eight and Hudson's five. Um, and as a family, we love camping and biking and uh, spending time near the lake, paddleboarding and things of that nature. So that's a uh, quick summary. That's, that's me. And even just to add, I know um, it's tough to, you know, compliment yourself when you're talking about your sporting career. But yeah, even one of the, you know, a few of the different things that that Josh is known for is, you know, the first ever backflip in a sit ski. I know that's sort of one thing that I always love bragging to many friends and coworkers and, and new peers into the the sporting world. And and so that, you know, first let's just touch on that as a as a skier and and how was that experience. Um, of yeah that challenge and then saying all right let's get out and give it a try yeah uh indeed it was definitely a pretty formidable challenge and that's i think what attracted me most to it is the the curiosity of if it would be possible to do something like that and it was a blend of my previous life of uh freestyle skiing and then the new world of riding the sit ski and i i felt like it was possible and over a period of a few years, I just assembled the right people that helped to uh, provide that affirmation and the right direction. And, and then finally, when everything lined up, um, the moon, the stars, the snow, the, the jump itself, um, and, and really beyond that, just inside of myself feeling that I was prepared to take on the challenge and uh, do it in a good way. And so when I say prepared to take on the challenge, it was, um, when I broke my back, it was a ski accident. It was doing a, a forward rotation, so front flip. And instinctively, I knew coming into the jump that it was a, a bad idea. Um, it was going against the advice of my, my senior coaches that were there, even though I was coaching in that moment. Uh, there were some master coaches on site, and they said, ah, don't do it. And I came in too fast, and I ignored that advice, and everything said, don't go, don't go. And so the story of the backflip was a part curiosity if it was possible, and it was a part uh, resolution uh, to overcome that, um, that sense of like, I need to prove myself. Um, and the first couple of times that we set up the backflip, I had skied away and, and didn't even hit the jump. And then finally, again, when everything was lined up, I felt in my heart that it was the right time to explore something big like that. Uh, ended up doing the backflip, and apparently it was such a such a scene that it landed me right on the Ellen DeGeneres so which was pretty neat uh neat to meet somebody uh of of that caliber who had honestly overcome so much adversity in her life uh in in a different way maybe not physical adversity but certainly a lot of adversity in her world 
uh, and somebody who uses that, uh, her platform that she's created to do good. Yeah. And so selfishly, it was super fun. Uh, but at the same time, it was really neat to see the impact it had on the whole Paralympic sporting world because it really was one of those big moments for our sport community where the world looked at possibility and not disability. And I thought that was pretty special. Yeah, we'll make sure to share that link. And so you definitely can check it on out for yourselves, for anybody out there. And and because, yeah, once you see it, you know, I'm sure you're sort of enjoying how us talking about it. But once you see the video, then you're like, wow, that was pretty unbelievable. And and that's probably why I stay at indoor sports. And I don't know if I'd be able to do that on the, on the ski at all either. So that was pretty awesome to check that on out. Um, I know we touched on it a bit, but um, actually, yeah, what is your involvement with the upcoming um, Paralympic Games? The winter games so you you nailed it by uh, the title of chef de mission uh or team captain and the the role is it's certainly layered um athlete support is the primary one in being at the center of athlete support and so i look at my role on one hand is like i sit between the kids table and the parents table and the kids are that's the fun table that's the athletes they're out there living the best life and, and representing our country and the adults table is the senior leadership, the integrated support teams. And I just, you know, broker in between the two tables, making sure that all the athletes needs are met and uh, that it's perceived uh, accurately from the senior leadership from an athlete's lens. So coming from that sport background, uh, also worked closely with each of the teams and we have five, we have uh, Paranordic, we have snowboard cross, we have Alpine, we have curling and we have sledge hockey. And so worked with each of the programs to develop a vision that would bind us as a team, because now we're coming together as five individual sports teams into one Team Canada. And uh, the vision that we agreed upon was to elevate, motivate, and unite. And the last couple of years has been pretty difficult for everybody, and certainly a challenge for these athletes to train, but um, they're humble in also recognizing how fortunate we are to be an athlete and what a privilege that is. So it's a bit of a, a duty and a responsibility that we carry to elevate and motivate those around us, Canadians and people around the world to uh, embrace the challenges. And, and in the words of Terry Fox, you know, the value facing a challenge. And so uh, embrace the challenge is an opportunity to grow. And the, these days, challenges are everywhere. Uh, and then to unite, uh, it seems the, the world is having a harder and harder time agreeing or being comfortable in disagreements. And so people are finding more and more divide. So uh, in the words of the great Nelson Mandela, sport is a powerful tool to bring us together. Uh, it speaks to the youth in the language that none other does. And it fills uh, a space that was once despair with hope. And uh, geez, you know, if uh, sport can do that, and if that's Nelson Mandela's take on sport, uh, then I feel like we really do have a great privilege, uh, a duty and a responsibility to have fun on the field to play and you know we're canadians we're a winter sport country um we're out there to to do our best and when we do our best we're typically pretty successful on the the, the paralympic stage but beyond that beyond medals it's a pretty unique opportunity to elevate motivate and unite people in a yeah. pretty important time and i think that's great you know for both of us as Paralymp previous paralympic athletes and, and i think that's what's great now with the shift mission that it is including athletes previous athletes to, to be part of that too. And so that's, you know, I'd say that uh, Josh is sort of underselling it at times and that he's just supporting each athlete and each team and programs at the games. But then once that's done, he's doing a lot of work behind the scenes and there's a lot of work. I know it's, uh, you know, my hat's off to you. Hopefully you get a bit of rest either before and after. <laughs> um, but yes, I know it's uh, definitely going to be a full plate for you. And, and that's, what's great though, as a previous athlete, you, you sort of know, what the athletes needs are and just, you know, sometimes it's whether it is just an, you know, uh, an extra blanket or an extra pillow or, you know, just making things a bit easier for those athletes to get out there and perform their best. So I know it's, uh, it's great that we have got a few more athletes that are, are now chef missions and getting into those positions and getting out there and, and uh, yeah, like I said, good luck. And thanks for joining us here today. I know you're getting ready probably very quickly to head over to the game soon. I know we touched on it a bit earlier too. Um, what were some of your successes in sport? I know we've sort of touched that you've been an athlete. Um, so what are, what were your biggest accomplishments in sport? <laughs> the, uh, the, Coles, the Coles notes. <laughs> the Coles notes. Uh, once upon a time in a galaxy far, far away, 
Uh, I skied uh, freestyle skiing and I had a chance to go toe to toe in dual moguls with an icon and somebody that I really looked up to in sport, uh, Olympic champion, Jean-Luc Brassard. He won uh, gold for Canada in Lillehammer 94. And uh, to have a chance to ski amongst greatness was is a pretty, pretty big accomplishment for me then. Uh, and uh, moving out of freestyle into coaching, uh, I felt like that in itself was a pretty significant accomplishment, being able to share my passion for mountain sport and, and the culture of the sport community as a whole was, was pretty amazing because I, I knew I was hooked on outdoor living and sport and activity and I thought it was fun being an athlete and I found it even more rewarding uh, as a coach. Um, as you mentioned, uh, you know, the accolades, you know, I, I earned a medal for Team Canada in Vancouver by the color of sil uh, silver and then uh, in, in Sochi, a gold and a silver as well. Uh, and perhaps one of the biggest uh, nods, I suppose, was being elected by the, the team and uh, then the chef de mission um, to be the flag bearer for Team Canada. And I think, think right there, right, right there. Uh, there's a picture of me uh, in the closing ceremonies in Sochi. Uh, there's the backflip. There's the finish area in Vancouver skiing uh, with all my friends and family. So geez, that's, uh, there's your Coles notes. There's probably a few other moments in there, but sport, um, you know, beyond the, the, the highlights, um, it's, it's the experience in between that I miss the most. It's the travel, it's the training, it's the camaraderie with my teammates that I miss. I do miss the thrill of being in the start gate because there's so much potential. Um, and there's also that sense of vulnerability because you don't know what's going to happen when you push out of the gate. You might have the best performance of your life and you might trip on your toes and land on your face before you get past the first turn pin. Uh, and so that's a really unique experience as well. And, and, and that's what I miss, Richard. I, I Sure, that was fun and that's fun, uh, but I miss the moments in between. I'm being part of the team and, and really dedicating my life to something that you're so focused on, eh? Like life is busy and uh, with Zoom, it's great. Yeah, we can, we can travel the world in the click of a mouse um, but I, I miss those moments where you're hyper-focused on one activity or one objective and you really put all of yourself into it and you realize what you're capable of, of there. So I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to do a little flexing uh, champion, world champion as well, X Games champion. Like yeah. I could probably do a couple, couple more flexes, but that's not what I miss. I miss the team and the travel and uh, that, that focus on a goal and objective. Yeah. No, it's always great as an athlete to get out there and, and enjoy those moments. And, and that's what everybody doesn't realize that, you know, yes, you, you do see the final stages of it, the, you know, of course, getting out there and possibly getting a medal, but yeah, it's always those three or four years leading up to it and sometimes even longer. Um, but yeah, it's always the lead up to those games and a lot of the hard work that ends up to it. And, and like, yeah, like you're just talking about too, it's, uh, you know, we've enjoyed those games, but you know, we, you know, the, our last meetup was, was downhill adaptive mountain, mountain biking. And so it was great to, you know, we're both very enjoy sports, sports and, and activity to the fullest. And so that was great to get out there and, and enjoy different, you know, a different sport and different avenues and go there and have a lot of fun. And so that's, uh, and I guess both of us were very similar that way that we still try to introduce sport to, to other new peers, new athletes, uh, new young guys and, and athletes and girls that want to get out and give it a try. And so that's the, the joy of it. And, and so is that, how, how does that tie into your new job? How has that been going? Uh, with the chef role or my day job, which is your, sport delivery. Your, <clears throat> yep, your day job. The day job. Well, um, I'm just going to touch a minute on what you were saying about the mountain bike and, and rubbing shoulders together, which is so much fun. Uh, and, and being able to introduce new sport to salty old dogs like ourselves, <laughs> or just introduce sport to somebody who's uh, newly injured. Uh, or just trying sport for the first time if they have a mobility challenge. And man, oh man, I just love that opportunity. Uh, the ethos that I like um, is empowerment through adventure and healing through community. And so when we do these bike camps or whatever it may be, uh, there's something just so wonderful about allowing somebody who's got some mobility challenges feel the freedom of movement in a new way, and then be deeply immersed in nature uh, and maybe accessing a part of the world that they felt limited from. And so that's like, that's pretty rich and that's pretty rewarding to experience firsthand uh, as a user or as somebody who's supporting a program like that's that's pretty amazing and so I'm glad that we got to bump into each other on those trails and I hope to again very soon 
terms of my day job, it's a, uh, it's a fun one. Uh, so it, it does uh, trend uh, in the sporting world, but on the, uh, the Olympic pathway, not the Paralympic pathway. And, and I find that pretty interesting that I get to govern the group is uh, freestyle BC. Um, and so the sport of freestyle skiing in the province, uh, I work with a, a bunch of really amazing people from a board of directors to coaches, to uh, all the officials and judges to ensure that we have safe, fun and fair programming for, for kids around the province. And uh, it's, it's been great. Like our challenges are sustainable growth, uh, providing unique opportunities to develop our coaches so that they have a better opportunity to have a positive impact on the kids. And in the last couple of years, it's been amazing because um, outdoor individual sport has had the least impact from the pandemic, albeit we've been affected, um, but we've been able to keep the doors open um, almost throughout the entire time, which we all know um, sport has a pretty profound effect on our physical body, but also on our, our mental, emotional and spiritual body as well. And um, to be able to provide the opportunity for kids and their families to be outside and to to be active and and to get that fresh air running through their system is it's been super challenging <clears throat> like exhausting to try and uh navigate what the provincial health office uh, has uh, in order to keep everybody safe uh, and then uh, interpret that accurately for our association is nearing 1700 people so you know communicating that effectively to make sure that we all stay safe uh, but yet we're still you know out there and and active and engaging and, and uh, yeah i know that's always a challenge with the health orders and with the families and the athletes and yeah i'm sure it's very tough for somebody in your position that's got to work with everybody and and uh yeah pretty old right on crew q when you're talking about kids and was that young hudson in the background yeah 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah yeah they're uh, yeah. large and in charge around here they feel like they own the place they just don't pay any bills yeah yeah that's how it always starts um and then maybe just add a bit more in regards to uh, sort of the, my now, my current job with Praxis. Um, but just with what kind of technologies have you seen that have changed, you know, maybe your sport, but also, yeah, just all sport in general with, you know, same thing with hand cycles and uh, sit skis. Uh, has there been any major changes that are, have you been leading um, a few changes also in regards to the sport and what is um, have there been any major adaptations or innovations that have helped you with your sporting career? Well, back in my day, uh, we, uh, I, I certainly found that the equipment uh, was limiting the athlete from their full potential. And so that was pretty frustrating. But at the same time, I was really, really fortunate to have had an injury in 2004, uh, made the Canadian ski team in 2007. And of course, we all know that Vancouver hosted the 2010 game. So there's a pretty significant influx of resource from on the podium in the federal government to make sure that uh, Canadians were as successful as we could be. And so there was a ton of energy put into uh, the Sitski. And so it went from a place that was what I found to be limiting to uh, the last time that I wrenched on my Sitski was 2013, just prior to the games in Sochi. And uh, what are we that eight, nine years later, it's still a better machine than I am. And uh, so the, the evolution in that five-year window was pretty spectacular in terms of the seating and how uh, I'm fitted to the machine or how all the athletes are fitted. So we played with some F1 technology in terms of airbag molding our body to the machine so that one, uh, our safety was primary. So skin integrity was at the forefront and then also performance was right beside it so that we could get the most out of our gear. And then we messed around with geometry and suspension. So we worked closely with bike companies to uh, look at different ways that the uh, the linkage would work and closely with uh, downhill mountain biking suspension to ensure that uh, we had the right uh, suspension to absorb all the bumps and jumps that we were doing. And so that's that's one bucket. And I was a part of that conversation, which has been super fortunate because it was not a strong card for me thinking technically and with an engineer's hat on, but I learned a lot. And now I've just been witness to and a beneficiary of many other sports that seem to be accelerating, like you mentioned, mountain biking. And so uh, there's a company out of Poland that makes a, a bike called Sport On, the Explorer, which is a really fun hand cycle uh, that can take on a lot of terrain, which is cool. And I've been witnessing the uh, and watching the evolution of the bowhead bike and how much potential that's bringing to the table. 
which is, in the last couple of years, you know, we were, I would say, fairly limited to road bikes, which not bad. But now the whole environment is now open and accessible due to this technology. And I'm fully taking advantage of that and absolutely love the places, oh, the places we will go. And uh, the last one, uh, perhaps, uh, is surfing. And so I looked at surfing 10 years ago, and we were using kayaks without any sort of seating or belts. And that was obviously no seating means pressure sores could be you know, right around the corner. So that was pretty limited on uh, that approach. And now there's uh, some pretty cool wave skis, they call them, that have good padded seats and, and uh, safety belts and all that. And, and so the sport is far better than I am. The technology is far better than I am. And that's great because now it's up to me to, to meet that challenge and see what I can do to improve myself and engage with the environment. And that's, I'll say it again and again, but like skiing, biking, surfing, it's all a way for me to be a bit closer to the lived environment and mother nature and engage and allow her to humble me and remind me of how small I really am and how important my role is, even if I am small, how important my role is, is uh, in being a steward to the land. And all the while while having fun, it's like a little kid on a trampoline, right? They don't know they're exercising, they're just bouncing because it's super fun. And suddenly at the end of the day, they're tuckered out and they're ready for bed and you're like, yes, as a parent. Whereas you ask them to go for a walk or something like that, like, I don't want to go for a walk, I just want to watch a movie. And you're like, go bounce on the trampoline, that sounds like fun. And so that's uh, a bit of an analogy of why I love sport and specifically the outdoor sport as much as I do is because it uh, merges me with the lived environment in ways that few other things do. Yeah. And that's great just with, uh, well, especially that's why we live here in BC or where we live. And, and that's, you know, there's a lot of opportunity to get out there and enjoy nature and, and sport and rec and, and get out there. And, and that's what I think for me too, with uh, my previous jobs, just with technology, you know, yeah, I've, I've been injured a bit longer than you. I got injured about a little over 40 years ago. Um, so I've seen technology really change and sport, parasport change and grow just as you're talking about that, you know, 30, 40 years ago that there wasn't as many sports that were available, but now with technology and new devices and new adaptations that, yeah, just about any sport and recreation activity is, is available for anybody with an SCI or any mobility issues that they can adapt it and, and make sure that it is available and accessible. So it's always great to, to make that happen. And yes, I've definitely seen it throughout sport too with my games and basketball and, and yeah, and all the sports that we play now. I'm like, I'll always give any sport a try once. Yeah, yeah. So, skiing, unfortunately, was a bit too too dangerous for me. I was like, yeah. When I first learned it, I did try it. I have said I've tried it. I tried it many years, many years ago in Vancouver Island. And um, oh, gee, who was the the athlete that we had come up from the states? He was a very good skier. Um, Chris Waddell, Bill Boness. Just from a double leg amp, probably maybe even Tyler a bit before. Walker. Yeah. Yeah, who knows? Now we're playing a guessing game. Yeah, yeah. I'm just now telling you yeah. all the people that influence me now. <laughs> that, that's that's how many athletes that we do know. We've been around that long that we know all a lot of different athletes. And and so, yeah, they came up and he did a clinic up in uh, Mount Washington. And so I went out and gave it a try and had a bit of difficulty at first. But then I said, hold on here. Let me just follow and see what he's doing. So I just remember going downhill and I'm just following him, trying to do the exact same thing. I'm like, oh, I'm getting the hang of it. And then all of a sudden he stops and nobody told me how to stop. <laughs> And so I'm like, whoa, just see him as I go zipping by him. And I'm like, right, how do I stop? And finally, somebody said, just fall over and crash as I was coming up to a few trees. So that was that was my very short uh, skiing career. And it was enjoyable. I had a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, so I, I tend to stay to the indoor or warmer sport activities nowadays <laughs> as we get older. Yeah. Just like cycling. That's what we do. Well, it just like it wasn't uh, probably the same time frame, but when I started, I felt it was pretty sketchy too. I was worried about my health and well-being on the sit ski, and uh, again, that's where technology has bridged the gap. Is now I feel a lot more connected to the rig, so my body English is translated directly to the machine, and I feel like inherent uh, a lot of the hazards have been reduced due to the in, in improvement in technology. But here nor there. Maybe, yeah, maybe I should try it. the last. So when I did try that, that was probably about thirty years ago. And then I did try cross country pair of skiing. When did I do that? I said that was a lot sooner. That was about six or eight years ago. Okay. And so yeah, so I definitely have tried some of the newer equipment. But yeah, maybe I should give it a 
give it a go again and, and get out there and have some fun. And, and yeah, like I said, I like to get out there and try any kind of sport, which I'm sure we both are just, as you mentioned, you know, we're sort of kids for life as we hear from our partners and so on. I definitely hear that from my wife and I just get out there and like to have a lot of fun, as you mentioned earlier. Now, one big question too, as you just talked about with different technologies with sports, um, and one of the biggest benefits, you know, yeah, like you just mentioned, just with the different buckets. For anybody who doesn't know, uh, sit ski, gee, how, how, what's a good way to explain it? You've got the ski, but then you're sort of, in the old days, it would just be a bucket that it pretty well is sat on top of the skis. And then you would sit in there and then position your feet. And mainly you would sort of tie it down as well as you can with whatever you've got. And so now, as, as Joss was just talking about, there's new technology that they're now is as you mentioned a form fitting um, gee golly yeah. yeah 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 it's wild um i was fortunate to rub shoulders with one of the greats christopher devlin young from the u.s who was around since the onset of, of the sport of sit ski in the mid 80s and it was literally uh, a toboggan on the snow and they would have ice picks in their hands and they would jam the ice picks to stop or pivot the machine and then slowly uh they decided to get a seat attached to a solid frame uh, onto a ski and so no suspension and then they started to carve a snow ski and obviously it was probably pretty hard on the body and then they started to incorporate suspension i think canadian daniel wesley was one of the first to pull uh, a shock out of uh, i think maybe an old car and he had the gooseneck of the top of a lamp post and then he jammed the suspension in there and created a bit of dampening and, and really changed the game for a lot of people uh, in terms of performance and also the sustainability of an athlete in that. Because, like, again, technology is like, it's not that long ago and there was nothing there. And I think that would have been a pretty rough ride. So kudos to the, uh, the Daniel Wesleys and the Christopher Devlin Youngs. And there's a long list of uh, Christopher Waddell and Bill Bowness and Stacey Kohut and, and so on and so forth that really put themselves out there and stayed focused to their, their passion and changed the game so that young kids like me could come in and say, hey, you know what, that's good, but we can do better. And uh, I'm sure the next generation is looking at the gear and saying, hey, this is limiting. Uh, let's see what we can do to improve it. Uh, yeah, it's fun. Yeah. It's a baton toss uh, from, you know, pioneers like yourself. Uh, and every once in a while, I feel old. And I'm like, I was a pioneer once. But really, it's, it's folks like yourself and those that I've just named that have opened the door. Um, for all of us to look at sport and do it a bit differently, but still do it and love it. Yeah. Thanks for calling me old, but not quite calling me old. Pioneer sounds much better. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's a, uh, you know, as mentioned, it's great to be part of the, you know, see the evolution and, and the transition of sport. And, and even now, like even we can talk about media, you know, now that we're doing a, an interview to, you know, promote the Paralympics and, and getting ready for the 2022 games. But, you know, let's talk about media that was much different, you know, when I first started that I think uh, my first game was in 96 in Atlanta. And I, if I recall, I think we had one Canadian reporter that joined and, and I think he got probably got a, a small column in the paper. <laughs> and so it's great now just with the, the growth, you know, of the sport and and our programs and the athletes, um, you know, even just partnered up with all the different sponsors and getting the Paralympic athletes you know, included with the Olympic athletes too on a lot of those commercial spots. And, and so, yeah, that's always great to get that kind of promotion. And, and, you know, I'd say that you're definitely a leader in that too, in doing that first backflip, you know, that definitely opened a lot of doors, as you talked about, you know, we can talk about the changes of, of equipment, but yeah, it is always the, that next athlete that's always coming up doing the next, the next trick, the next step, the next and you know, evolution of the sport and game and, and equipment wise. And so it's always great to, to watch that and see what's going on because yeah nowadays uh, it's great now that we've got more technology and more uh, researchers and more you know more people are now thinking about the parasport world or the sci community and saying here let's you know we can always talk about how much we can try to help them but well let's now work with them and go into that next step yeah and, yeah. Uh, yeah so that's sort of what we're going to do now and so i'd say uh with sport, you know, we've sort of touched on it here and there, but what has sort of been the biggest, uh, and I, I'm sure this is a very uh, long circle with it, but how has it impacted your life, your health, your well-being? And, you know, of course, we've touched on it here and there with our partners and our, our lives and, and everything that we've done. But, yeah, what's 
sort of one of the biggest things that Parasport has really helped helped you in, in your journey, um, especially as you touched on it with it, you got injured skiing and then got back into it. And that was very similar to my wife. Uh, she was pretty well along the same lines too. And, and so, yeah, it's definitely um, a, lot, a lot of growth there, but yeah. How does it impact I'll, you? I'll play with that in a couple of ways, Richard. Um, <clears throat> when we were talking about media, and I think that's important to recognize now I'll date myself as old because when I was injured, there was no YouTube, there was no Facebook, and there was no visibility to Parasport, at least to my knowledge. And I did as much research as I could to find out what sit skiing was because I knew that it existed. I just didn't know what it would look like or how to access it or what the top athletes in the world were, were doing or how they were performing. So it was this big mystery, like looking into a black hole. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. And I feel like the Vancouver 2010 games was a strong catalyst for the, the visibility in Paralympic sport. I feel like London 2012 did an extraordinary job of bringing the Paralympic movement to the forefront. And for me to be a part of that time has been significantly impactful in, in who I am. So not just the sport, but also the attention on the conversation of sport. Sport, whether it was <clears throat> um, in my life as a freestyle skier or as a Paralympic athlete, provided me an opportunity to focus, to practice discipline and to express my passion. And being able to do that, staying focused on a task and on a goal and an objective and having a plan to achieve something uh, and, and to have something that I'm passionate about has helped me to understand that we are more than just the body. Even though sport is very much about the body, it's about physical well being, it's uh, faster, higher, stronger in the Olympics. However, the Paralympic Agitos, and I see that so, uh, so beautifully behind you, that quilted blanket, um, is mind, body, and spirit. And so with me, sport has allowed me to transcend in some ways the, the mind and the body and, and really be uh, in harmony with the spirit. So, whoa, whoa, that's a bit out there and esoteric. Okay, so uh, fine tuning the technology and getting the sit ski to a place where I feel like it is no longer inhibiting me, but enhancing me. Uh, suddenly the sit ski disappears and so does my disability. And now I'm just my imagination and the snow ski. And when the snow ski is merged well with the sit ski and aligned well with the conditions of that day, so the tune of the ski or the type of ski that I'm using, suddenly the snow ski disappears. And so now it is just my... I don't know if it's consciousness or subconsciousness, but now I am just literally with the environment. Hi, Huddy. Hi. We're talking about the power sport, buddy. This is my five-year-old I was telling you about. Do you remember Richard? We call him Bear. Mm -hmm. I'm doing an interview right now. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, yeah, you're live on yeah. TV. Yeah, this is no big deal. Oh, this hi. is the family. Yeah, why don't you come in and say hi? Let's it's Bear. Yeah. Hey, Bear. And then you can hijack Huddy for me. We remember, I saw you guys. We were hi, biking Bear. the last time I saw you. How are you, Lacey? Hi, good. How are you? Pretty good. Yeah. Oh, sorry to interrupt. No, no, you came at no. a good time. That's fine. Thank you. And uh, if Nova's around, you might as well get her to say hi. She's upstairs. I have to take her to music, but Heidi didn't want to go. You can take Heidi to music. Okay. I'm tied up right okay. now. Love Come you, pal. Bye, Bear. Yeah, see you guys later. Good to see you. you can Hopefully after COVID, we'll yeah. see you guys in person again. I can't wait. And so we'll leave that to Atlanta to decide to uh, leave that uh, in the show or cut out of the show, but that's great. So <laughs> that, that was really the sum point is the impact that uh, Parasport has had on me is it's allowed me to see myself beyond just my body. And so that, that's been super, super transformative in the sense that I no longer feel like I'm limited by my disability or that I have to feel limited in any capacity that the, the consciousness and the subconsciousness is a pretty incredible tool uh, in, in how we experience and navigate this crazy journey we call life. And so I'm so thankful that sports allowed me to feel that. And I feel a lot of athletes have that, whether, and, and maybe you can share something, Richard, as well, being on the court where you're making a play and suddenly you're moving and you make a pass and then your teammate you know uh, makes the shot or something like that. It's nothing left but just that moment. And that's a pretty beautiful experience. Actually, first, yes, I will touch on this blanket that's right here. Um, actually, that was a gift um, from my my uh, community, uh, Couch and Tribes Back Home. I think it was a gift after 
Golly, I don't recall which games, but I came back and, and the couch, my family and couch and tribe would always do a quick celebration after I came back from the Paralympic Games. And so that was one of the gifts. And and Josh did mention it's the Agitos, which everybody sort of knows the Olympics and knows the five Olympic rings. And this is the logo for the Paralympics. And so, yeah, so that's a, that was a great honor that, you know, the my family and the community, uh, that's the couch knit sweater that my community is really known for. Um, and so that's where uh, they were able to knit, um, yeah, the logo on there. And so that was, you know, it's a, a great gift. and. And of course, I wanted to finally put it up and, and display it. And yeah, we've uh, sort of had had it tucked away in the corner in, in one of the closets. So I, I said, no, we've got to share that now. Um, and so yeah, even just with sport for myself too, yeah, it is, you know, getting out there. And, and I've always said to myself that I would still continue to play as long as I enjoyed the games and enjoyed sport. And, uh, you know, I still enjoy a lot of sports now. Um, but my body sort of told me to retire from high level sports uh, back in 2012 after the London games. Um, but just when you're talking about with, you know, once you're going through a certain play or, or making things happen and, and that's when you do feel that, you know, a lot of that hard work, as I mentioned earlier, you're working hard, you're doing drills over and over and over again to finally make sure that that does work you know, in a game, you know, and uh, you know, and one big thing now too, when I'm working at either GF strong or just in the community, uh, introducing sport to anybody, a brand new, SCI uh, member or, or somebody that is, you know, uh, an SCI peer member that is just trying out a new sport for the first time. And, and you know, we're, we're talking about the Paralympics and going to the highest level, but I always talk about, you know, just getting out there and enjoying it too and make sure you have a good time. Um, not everybody has to become a Paralympic athlete, but as long as you get out there and, and find something you still enjoy doing, whether it's, you know, horseback riding, skiing, you know, kayaking, um, surfing, you know, adaptive mountain biking, still get out there and give it a go and, and make sure you just enjoy it. And, and it is very scary for anybody who is newly injured to say, oh, yes, I used to box or I used to, you know, ski beforehand, but I don't think I'm going to try that again. It takes time for them to get back, sort of get back on the horse and, and give it a go. But yeah, once uh, it's great to say, there's a lot of technology now that can make that still happen and, and we'll adapt it to whatever your level of disability is and, and make sure that, you know, Hopefully you can get out there and try it again and, and enjoy it and, and stick with it again. Um, but yeah, that's one of the big things that sports for me too, that I've just really enjoyed playing it. You know, I'm very fortunate to enjoy it at the highest level, as such as yourself, but yeah, it's just stuff that we love. We just love doing it. It's hard to say that, you know, this is our careers or this is our lives. It's like, well, no, we're just doing what we love. <laughs> that's one of the big things that I've always talked about. And so one of the final, uh, let's see here, one of the final questions um, in that, yeah, you're just getting ready to get, get down to the games, the Paralympics. Uh, who should we be watching out for the Paralympics in this go around? You know, who are the stars that we should be checking out for? Like right now, I'm, I'm watching some of the Olympics now and, and yeah, getting ready for the Paralympics. But uh, who are some of the names and who are the sports that we should be checking out? All of them. We're Team <laughs> yep. Canada. Uh, yep. We're actually fairly tempered with our expectations given the calamity the last couple of years, the lack of events and the lack of uh, context and point of reference we have against our competitors because it's been so scrambled. So in that sense, uh, the objective is fairly open, which we think is great. And, and the same was with the Olympics. They didn't have a stated objective in terms of how they were going to do. What I can tell you from behind the scenes is that our team's uh, managed the last couple of years really well. And the hockey team, they're on one right now. They are motivated. They are strong. They've got a good blend of uh, elder statesmen, if you will, that have been on the program for many Paralympic cycles, including Greg Westlake, who will now be competing in what I believe is his fifth games. So they've got that leadership, but they've also got some young guys cutting their teeth that are strong and fast and really motivated to improve on uh, the last games, which they I feel like they did pretty well, but they weren't happy with silver and they're going to push for more. And they seem like they're geared up to do just that. And they're, they're not shy about it. Our yeah. paranordic team, uh, the perennial favorite, uh, Brian McKeever is, has been such a dominant force in the sport. Well, he is also a very big inspiration and leader for the young athletes coming up, including guys like Mark Arendt, who um, did very, very well in Pyeongchang and is, is taking that model of mentorship and leadership throughout the entire program. And so the Nordic team is quite stacked. 
the Alpine program, uh, which is my alumni, uh, is doing quite well. And there's uh, some young ladies coming up, uh, Katie Cambusier, if I got that right, sorry, Katie, uh, is very new to the scene, but had quite the impression at World Championships and, and landed a few podiums in her first year. Uh, Molly Jepsen had great success in Pyeongchang, and uh, I think she's on one right now. So it'll be great to watch her carry forward that momentum. The uh, where are we the snowboard team is absolutely uh, at a new level that they haven't been as a program or a team in a while. And albeit their team will be small, only four athletes heading over. Uh, they're all very, very dialed in right now under the leadership of Mark Fawcett, who's a world class snowboard coach and working with guys like uh, Ty Turner. And uh, you know, in his second year, he's pretty much been on every podium, which is absolutely unheard of for uh, a rookie on the circuit to, to have that kind of dominant effect and curling. Uh, I love our curling team and uh, great leadership there uh, with Mark Iderson and Ina Forrest and uh, some young athletes coming up as well that are uh, following the, the leadership quite nicely and they're, they're trending well uh, to, to again, kind of make, make quite the scene in Beijing. So I wouldn't count anybody out uh, and really our, our, Herculean task and and our Olympic objective right now is to make it their healthy. And so that's why it's hard to really state an objective is like every day we're walking around uh, landmines, if you will, ensuring that we keep our teams healthy so that we can board that plane, get over to Beijing. And once we get to Beijing, then we can, it's almost the cherry on top, simply being at the games. Uh, whereas once upon a time, um, the games itself was the, the, the Herculean task. And so it'll be really interesting to watch how it shakes out. Uh, we saw in Tokyo that our team uh, and the teams behind the team had a very good strategy and it was effective. And we're seeing as well with the Olympics in Beijing that Team Canada is, is striving for greatness and achieving that in many ways. And we're, we're so closely coupled with the Canadian Olympic Committee that many of our staff are already over there supporting those programs. And so that will carry over. And a lot of the concerns that we have about uh, some of the, the details that do matter are being resolved in advance. And so that's a wonderful part about the role that I get to play is seeing all the pieces behind the scene and seeing how hard so many people have to work in order to open the doors and pave the path so the athletes can do exactly what they've been training for so many years to do. Yeah, yeah. the Canadian Paralympic Committee, they've always done a great job in, in making it as easy for all the athletes to get there and do their best. You know, we've been working hard and, and they're just doing their hardest to make sure that we just get out there and, and perform the best that we can. And, and yeah, it's always great. Uh, sometimes that's one one of the perks of being the Paralympics and being right after the Olympics that you work out all the kinks at the Olympics and you find out a few of the issues that happen there and then everybody gets a bit of that experience and then everything runs sort of smoothly once you get to the Paralympics. And and so it'll be uh, we'll be looking out, watching online and watching on TV whenever we can and, and cheering on Team Canada and Josh down at the, the next uh, 2022 Beijing Games, Paralympic Games. So thanks on behalf of Praxis. Um, Josh, I'm glad you could be part of this. And I know you've got a busy schedule. So thanks for joining us here today. And uh, we look forward to cheering you guys on down there. Thanks for having me. It's been my pleasure.